Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. Hello, guys. Welcome. Welcome to our show. Good people, welcome. By the way, I don't want to discriminate bad people. Welcome to our show as well. Anyone who want to learn more about B2B or SaaS, it's better to stay tuned because many great skills are coming. Uh, and I'm so excited to discuss this topic with Nimanya Zivkovic. How are you? Hey, I'm good, especially after seeing the intro and a lot of... Uh photos reflecting my younger self so <laughs> nice well still got more hair so uh... yeah it's my team you know it's my team I, I i just tell them you know i have a guest please create some promo and yeah i don't know where they can find these photos but yeah they, they spend time researching online uh and yeah combine them uh, to create this promo uh внимание before we start, just tell more about yourself, about experience, background, and why, why you often appeal on my uh, feed on LinkedIn. I'm interested about that. Yeah, uh, I mean, look, the, the background is pretty interesting. Uh, started in uh, playing basketball a lot when I was a kid for like 13 years, then moved uh, into studying marketing. Uh, but I figured out that the university didn't give me enough knowledge. So, I, yeah, that's it. Uh, so I moved uh, to, uh, to actually learn marketing through doing. So I found my own NGO working with youth, working a lot with uh, vulnerable groups, with UNICEF. And I learned marketing by, by doing. Uh, organized the, uh, it probably is the biggest summer camp in, uh, in, in Balkans with 200 people from uh, 18 countries uh, without advertising, just using Facebook groups. So I found a way to, you know, how we can work without, with a limited budget. But the most important thing I figure out, like, uh, we don't need to chase the money. We can chase the value and money will chase us. Uh, so... Uh, then moved to the to first agency that I work based in Canada uh, from rookie to to the GM in 13 months. Uh, that was that was my journey, kind of interesting and uh, and really fast going through that. While I was there working on a two startups, then uh, specializing in uh, marketing automation, uh, website uh, personalization. Uh, pretty advanced stuff for 2017-2018. And um, I was um, basically what I saw is that uh, performance marketing works well. The, the, the saying at that time was it works well, uh, while it works while you sleep, right? Automation and performance marketing. Yes. But I figured out that it, its limit is on the budget. So it works only until you have the budget. When you don't have the budget, then you need brand, then you need the awareness, then you need demand, then you need all kind of different stuff. So I, uh, I moved to to creating funky marketing. Uh, I didn't know that I'm gonna go into the B2B because most of my experience was based on uh, on B2C. But uh, I had nine thousand followers, actually nine thousand connection, more followers on LinkedIn. So I, uh, I've done like. 250, 60 interviews with, with people, uh, a lot of virtual coffees. And I figure out that there's a pattern that keeps repeating. And it is that in B2B, B2C is still about to come. So no humanity, no emotions. Uh, everybody were still thinking of the ICP as, as a building, as a factory, not as a set of people uh, inside the company that you need uh, that you need to sell to and no relationships so it was all transactional uh and i figure out you know with what i know from b2c with the strategies that i know i can go and implement that in b2b and help the companies and uh basically it it was the time when the slowly the transition from lead gen to demand gen started to happening uh and uh why do you see me on linkedin because uh Basically, 
I share everything that I know. I share the things that I do. I share results. And uh, that's how I find people that are working with me. And that's how I'm uh, closing clients. Basically, in the first 18 months, we closed, uh, I think, 63 uh, clients, all by focusing on LinkedIn. And in a, now it's uh, in January, it's like the third year of the company. And we work with, with 100 companies. So uh, all of them came to us inbound uh, using the or true demand that we were created. So in short, that's it. Nice, nice. Love your experience. Yeah. By the way, uh, you know, I, I felt that you broke the code on LinkedIn, but yeah, it, it's another way. So that's good. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I, I love your quotes, uh, especially when you mentioned, uh, you know, it's better to chase value than money will come. I agree with that. It's interesting that, uh, you know, many years ago, I don't remember exactly like more than 10 years ago, I didn't use it because uh, I created online projects to earn money. Uh, I didn't uh, feel that I need to share value. I created only e-commerce projects, but competition was low at that time. That was possible. Uh, today, customers have choices you can't game the system you can't cheat the system because uh google linkedin any system are smart enough to recognize value because customers need it so i agree 100 percent and I, I love this quote uh perfection is boring i, I hate perfection you know <laughs> because yeah it's, I don't know. it's uh let me tell you my wife bought me this so i'm not sure what it exactly means <laughs> uh, uh you know for me for me, perfection, uh, you know, uh, for example, when I check out why content creators uh, quit, uh, most in most cases, uh, they can't create perfect content. But I don't know who can create perfect content. Uh, and uh, uh, without experience, consistency, it's impossible to create perfect content uh, okay you you can't create it but you can uh, have the goal to create uh, to improve a little bit step by step and yeah that's why for me perfection is not good way uh, it's better to be consistent and this perfection will come like money like anything else so yeah good okay um, i have the question about the difference can you tell the difference between b2b b2c because you have experience in b2c as well but what kind of difference when you uh, sell to b2b yeah there are a couple of things like the the basic ones are b2c is business to customers so you're selling directly to the customers and in b2b you are selling to uh to businesses so you are not in uh in b2c is uh usually one to many in B2B is one to one in that way. Uh, and what is interesting there in B2C, um, marketing is the one that sells. You don't have sales uh, as you have in B2B. In B2B is a lot different because uh, the deals are longer. The average value of the deal can go from, um, I don't know, from two, two $200 to two millions or even above. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be able to sell that, you need a lot more time and a lot more resources than you need to sell something that's, that costs $15, right? So uh, those things are essential differences between the two. And looking at that in B2C, uh, you come back to buy a lot more frequently. And in a shorter period of time in B2B, for example, if you're selling let me give an example, industrial, so to the factory, uh, you're selling them once in five years. So to be able to sell them again in five years, you need to do a lot more work that doesn't include selling in those five years because like people change in the company, uh, management changes, uh, their needs changes, but when the time comes, they need to choose you again. So you need to be present and do a lot of things to, to be able to, to appear on top of mind when it happens. So mm -hmm. um, what is similar is similar that you are selling to people in, in, both, uh, in both industries, but in a different way and decisions are made in a different way. In B2C decisions are usually made 
by single person. Uh, in B2B, decisions are mostly uh, influenced by, by a lot of bias biases that are over there. For example, like, I don't know, I know somebody, so I will recommend that agency that come and working with us. I, um, as a CMO, I have a task to choose the best tool that will help us, I don't know, like schedule post. I will just go uh, basic. And um, I usually go and I choose, right, the, the best one. If you go to Google and you find everybody says that they are the best one, I will choose them. Why? Because uh, if it doesn't work and the CEO comes to me and said, why did you choose this tool? It doesn't work. I can say, hey, look, Google it. You will see it's the best one. Everybody says that. It doesn't matter if it's the right fit for you. But he is basically uh, keeping his place in the company by doing that. So a lot of small decisions that we don't see uh, from outside that are affecting the way uh, that, that we buy and that we actually sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, valuable. Okay, uh, when we sell to B2B, uh, that means we need to sell to a human being as well. It's not to sell uh, to the whole company because we need to sell to uh, a person who can transfer our data to uh, decision makers or uh, this person can be a decision maker, but uh, the final decision uh, can be accepted you know, uh, in some meetings. So can you tell how to find a buying persona, uh, how to uh, choose who is the right fit and set up the right marketing message? I mean, the answer is always customer research, right? Doing customer in interviews uh, and, and doing the research and finding uh, the way. I, usually, I said, don't start building a product or building a company if you don't know to who you are selling it to, right? So um, it's the way that I founded Funky Marketing. Basically, I had some hypotheses. I talked with people. I saw that there is a pattern. So you don't need to do like 260, 70 calls as, as I did. You can get away with a lot uh, with a smaller number uh, but you need to go and ask some of the questions that will actually show you that there's a, um, some, a problem that is burning mm -hmm. basically you know not just a problem that is uh, you know uh, okay we know that we have it but it's not urgent to solve we need you need to find the urgent problem and build the company or the product or the services around it but how do you choose whom you are going after uh let's say if you look you already know the, co the industry the niche basically you need to see how is decision making process going inside the company you do that also by talking to customers uh if you if there is not an option another thing is it wasn't possible like uh, a year or two ago it's possible now it's using a podcast like this one for example, somebody can come and say, um, you know, uh, I've been listening to Anatoly's podcast and I uh, he is hosting different people from marketing world. I want to sell to them and I've been listening to podcasts and find out, uh, you know, how is decision making process going in their companies? How are they going to get educated? Do you all do they already have somebody who um, a vendor who is providing marketing services or no? Uh, if they do who is in charge for that and what is actually the process. When you have all of these things, it's easier to come up and sell. But the thing is that you need to discover all of those things. Also, when you when you get those information, you discover how you are going to differentiate from your competitors. And basically you do the reverse engineering. So when you get, have all those data, marketing is basically the, let's call it the activity that facilitates the buyer's journey. So it enables somebody to come uh, prepared uh, to the company to buy the product that they want to. Uh, and then only then they talk to the sales. So uh, you go reverse engineering, start from the end goal, and then you work it backwards. Nice, nice. Awesome. Okay, let's talk about 
personalization. Can you tell how to personalize the message uh, to decision makers uh, who can decide to cooperate with us or not? Because, you know, uh, I think you get, I get, uh, many other people get a lot of spam messages who are trying to sell link building, uh, something like this, many other things. They don't care about our uh, preferences, interests. Uh, for example, um, sometimes I get the message, you are so good with fashion. Uh, I have awesome t-shirts. Guys, you know, my uh, expensive t-shirt costs like uh, $10, you know. I usually search for discounts. So uh, I'm not there, uh, target audience. So tell more about personalization, how to personalize the message and uh, to get sales. Yeah, look, uh, I, I start with the narrative. And when we have the narrative, then we know uh, what we look. Let's assume that we have already done the customer research because we talked about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we have the research, when we have the insights, the one thing we, that we need to do is create the narrative around it. I, I like to use Andy Ruskin's uh, framework, meaning the first one is basically starts with a bigger change. Why are we starting with a bigger change? Because people are more free to talk about their problems if they know that you know, the change is happening no matter what they do. So we start with that. Then we go old versus new or bad versus evil, uh, bad versus good, meaning that uh, we need to prove that some things are old and outdated and our solution is the new one that is coming. This is the most difficult part when we need to dig and find the data that will support, uh, you know, that something is old and that there is a new solution that we are bringing to them. The third one is the promised land. Meaning, you know, if they work with us, what's the outcome? How can we describe the outcome? It needs to look like a promised land. So uh, our offer is actually appealing, right? The fourth one is actually the moment when we start talking about what we are selling. So our services, our product. And in that fourth part is actually, uh, it's similar to the fairy tale. So like we are the lightsaber, they are the Luke Skywalker. Uh, we are Robin, they are Batman, or we are the fairy tale, uh, you know, uh, they are the Cinderella. Depending who's, yeah. who's listening, so, uh, uh, you know, fairy tales are something that is approachable to them. And in that part, we are showing how, um, how are we taking them to the promised land, uh, meaning what's our expertise, but also giving them resources so they can take somebody to the promised land without us. So we can... Uh, widen our message and the fourth one is the proof that we have uh, actually taken somebody to the promised land meaning case studies testimonials those kind of things when you set up things like that then you know exactly how you are you are differentiating then you know exactly where you are uh, comparing to the others and you, and you don't look at the competitors to differentiate you go from the customers and you go from yourself because I think this is what uh, what you can do to differentiate yourself uh, in a, let's call it the most unique way. Because it's harder to copy anybody else. It's harder to be someone else. It's the most easiest thing to be yourself, right? But you need to get to know yourself, your company, your resources, what you are built of. And then you need to know your customers. And in the middle, it's uh, your unique selling proposition. Yeah, by the way, I think, you know, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it's simple to be yourself and it's hard to copy someone else, but you can copy uh, and be a bad copy, you know, because uh, all businesses are different. And uh, I'm interested about uh, customer uh, lifetime value. For example, you know, uh, many years ago when I set up uh, Google Ads, uh, I didn't create a buying persona. I didn't uh, do many things that today custom uh, uh, marketers do because uh, of competition. I uh, bought clicks for uh, five, ten cents. Uh, I got a lot of sales results. Today I can't. I can't because of competition. Uh, and it's better to create. Uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, lifetime value to consider it. Uh, be, uh, uh, you know, many year, years ago, uh, I felt that I can invest a dollar and to get two dollars back. Today, sometimes 
you can't get two dollars back because you can sell to your customer more times your customer can bring your friends um, uh, so yeah something like this and uh, then you can get two dollars back and even more so tell more how to count this metric uh, uh, customer lifetime value yeah i mean look li uh, customer lifetime value is uh is one of the metrics that um i would say is the most important if you look at the retention especially now when we are getting into the crisis because it's time to focus on the existing customer not necessarily on the acquisition because like acquisition costs are going up uh this is another metric that we're going to mention so it's it's cuck uh but what we can do uh and, and what we what i want to explain here is there is the revenue that the customers bring to the company from the amount of time that they are uh paying for the tool is we are talking about the SaaS, uh and why do we need to take care of this and think about it because it's a lot more expensive to get new customers every month right if we get customers and they leave after the first month after the second month then basically we are just burning money getting people who don't want our tool who are not the right fit for our tool and if the customer lifetime value uh is on a higher level then we basically know that we are getting the right customers they are spending a lot of time with us uh and basically those are satisfied customers that will recommend us to the other to the other uh, potential customers and the other companies. And um, what is interesting here is uh, focusing on the relationship, right? That's why I, I don't like um, when we focus on just generating leads because usually it's MQLs, people that don't want to buy from us. Uh, we are getting them into the conversation where they don't want to talk with us. So they don't want to buy what we offer. They don't want to talk with us, but we are still willing to get them into the conversation and try to get them to buy, right? So uh, with that kind of thing, uh, the churn is getting bigger and bigger and lifetime value is getting lower and lower, which meaning customers are leaving after the month or two, they see that it's not a fit. But if, uh, if the marketing is doing uh, its job, and doing what it should do inside the B2B companies, which is usually not what they do. They usually do digital sales. Uh, so just getting leads. Basically, it means that, uh, that we are creating a relationship right from the start. So uh, to give you, um, to go a little bit more um, backwards, 99% of the customers in B2B are not in the market to buy right now. LinkedIn B2B Institute says it's 95%, but from the experience, I said it's less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, um, what you need to do is start creating relationships with companies when they are not on the market. So when they come to the market to buy, everybody wants to get them, right? It's less than 1%. A lot of companies are focusing just on closing the existing demand, which means that 1% that are on Google. So we need to go to the social media, we need to go to the communities, and we need to go uh, to some different places where they are hanging out to actually create the relationship. And we, if we create the relationship with them, they know our value, we are top of mind when they come to the moment they buy. So uh, they will come to us to buy because they know us, they know what we are selling, they know the value. We don't need to sell them. We are just here to facilitate the process. And if the uh, the sale, the sales is happening like that, basically the lifetime value is usually a, a lot bigger. Um, they call it now a hero pipeline, which meaning that uh, companies that are coming through demand that we are creating are closing in a 40% uh, they're coming to the website. So website source pipeline are closing at uh, the percent of uh, 40. And if you look at the other way or, or like lead gen or other things, they're closing at a lot more lower percent, which meaning closing at 40% deal and staying with us for the next three months, it usually means that they will stay for us longer and the lifetime deal of the customers is gonna uh, be um it's gonna go higher 
mm-hmm. and what it also means to kind of connect all the all the other um, all the other uh, m- metrics uh, mm-hmm. is that if we do it like that, average deal per user, average revenue goes up. Uh, average value of of the deal goes up uh which means that you know sales doesn't need to spend their time talking with people that are not interesting they can talk just to the people that are interesting it makes it easy for them to sell the larger deals right and if we are creating the awareness if we are educating the customers basically the sales cycle is also getting uh smaller which means usually in, in B2B, as we mentioned in the beginning, the sales cycles are a lot longer. And uh, what does it mean longer? It means from three months to three years sometimes, or even five, as I mentioned in the example. So if we can cut that time in half, they are able to get more customers, more good customers in that, in that period of time, which means uh, a lot more revenue is coming, and in the end, the lifetime value is going up. Yeah, valuable, valuable. Okay, uh, let's talk more about uh, customers' loyalty. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, I can't tell that I'm loyal with some brands because, um, yeah, uh, for example, uh, if you need loyalty, you can buy a dog, you know, so you, you can get loyalty. But in other cases, uh, I think uh, customers are looking for uh, better solutions, better uh, products. And uh, sometimes we have no time to check out because we are satisfied with existing products that we have. Uh, And for me, yeah, of course, the first thing you need to have high quality product. Uh, Without that, any uh, marketing methods can't help you, you know, to retain customers longer. Uh, Let's talk about another aspect, how to retain customers. For example, if I have high quality products, uh, but um, uh, any any tips how uh, how to retain them longer that you mentioned uh, acquisition costs much uh, more. And uh, I remember a few studies share that uh, uh, it costs five times more to acquire a new customer than retain existing customers. So yeah, even uh, in the recession, it's probably even more. So uh, any insights, how to retain customers, what kind of methods to use if I have high quality products? Uh, Give more value. That's the most obvious, the most obvious answer. Uh, Look, like you need to go to listen to those customers uh, at all times. Usually, I like to uh, advise companies that they talk to the customers from two different angles. One is the product team is talking to them to see uh, how are they using the product, are they using it the right way, what are some things that uh, that they are missing from the product, what are some things that they can improve. And when you have those information, that's how you set up the new features, right? How you improve the product, how are you going to update on those, and if the product that you started with for that small thing, for example, um, the product that, that my friends are uh, developing, uh, we can name it, uh, it was Arthur Dean, now it's Arthur Dapp, uh, for LinkedIn. Basically, it was first just the tool to schedule posts, right, for LinkedIn. Actually, to see how is the post crafted. Now they're coming up, they're listening to the people, uh, listening to the feedback to existing customers. They are using it and now they say, aha, uh-huh, maybe we can come up with a function that we can maybe make some of the text bolder. Maybe you can come up with the bullets. Uh, maybe you can come up with a way that we can schedule posts. Uh, now they are requesting, maybe you can come up with, uh, with the analytics and more advanced data so we can see what's happening. Uh, maybe you can come up with uh, say the the function that we can actually save the post that we don't publish, so we can get back to them uh, and rewrite them. You know those kind of things. Uh, then, from the other hand, um, other part of the company that needs to actually uh, get into those conversations with the customers is customer success team. Is the tool uh, doing its function and actually enabling them to get the results 
that they wanted from the start, right? Is the tool actually uh, giving the res bringing in the results that uh, that it should be? If not, something's wrong, right? Maybe it's a different thing from different companies. Then also, like, how are they using the tool? Meaning, uh, I can give a, a startup from Turkey that I was working with, one of the top 10 startups in Turkey. Uh, they are doing basically the onboarding. So it's a no-code tool that does the user onboarding. So they go uh, into project management, they go into onboarding, they go into the education, they go into the no-code tools, a lot of things. So a lot of people uh, using it for a lot of different things. So they need to talk to the customers to know what they should do to bring them the value, right? What are the resources that they need to invest further? Then when you go into that and you have all those insights, the upsell is always the way to go. If somebody is satisfied with, with the way you are using your product, you can add new features, but you can upsell that. When you upsell, the lifetime value goes up because you are getting more money from the same client. Then you can go into the um, affiliate marketing, of course, when you actually have the satisfied customers the the thing that you can uh basically it's a no-brainer what you can do is you can give them a chance to recommend you some of the uh you know their friends uh their uh, audience followers their customers and basically by doing that they are bringing you the new customers so you are growing growing your base just a couple of examples uh another one that i can come up with uh to also get from the service-based business perspective is, for example, you have customers with whom you are working from month to month, right? Uh, what you can do is uh, usually you have a call, which is once a month. When you give them the insights, when you talk about what you're going to do next, right, that way. If they are satisfied with that, you're giving them insights that they cannot find anywhere else you can turn that into the product, right? And charge more for, for that single conversation. Then through the content that you are creating, you are showing what you're doing with different customers, with different clients. They are consuming the content as well, the existing ones. So they come to you and say, hey, you were doing this with this client, maybe you can do this for us. Another way to increase, to increase the lifetime value. So uh, all depends from which perspective you are going, getting it. But the most important thing is talk to the customers and find uh, first define what's value for them and then see how you can implement that in your product or the service to benefit them. And the third part is that aligns with the fourth, uh, the fourth one in the strategic narrative is how can you empower them to promote your business on their own without you involving it? Usually that's affiliate marketing. Yeah, yeah, valuable. Okay, uh, let me share my story, personal story. Once um, I decided to pay for gas, like 30, 40 dollars uh, with uh, uh, a bank card, but uh, the transaction was declined. Uh, then the bank decided to uh, block my account uh, that was frustration because i didn't have another card uh, I, I i needed gas uh, so i decided this issue but it, it took for a while then i came to the bank uh, uh, and uh, spent there like um, uh, two hours uh, bank manager told me they can't decide this issue i need to call to call center uh, to safety team uh, then I spent two hours calling them, you know, to wait when someone will decide. And uh, like uh, I, I wasted uh, half of my day, you know, uh, then someone told me, yeah, yeah, uh, we can unblock your card. Uh, you can use your account. Uh, I couldn't do it a few uh, transactions before that. <laughs> so it's frustration. And I found that many big companies, uh, banks, uh, uh tools that have a lot of customers like plus thousand customers uh, they can't help 
uh, anyone, you know, it, it, take, it takes time, you know, to reach out to customer support. For example, LinkedIn, uh, social media, you, you can submit your request and can wait for a long time, you know, uh, to get reply back. So can you tell what to do for uh, companies that have a lot of customers, many customers, uh, but they can't talk to uh to all these customers you know and customers can be unsatisfied as i was you know uh, and uh, uh, i didn't change but the band because uh, i didn't have time you know to go to another bank to open all these accounts to it's the process but uh, anyway I, I think about that any insights how to satisfy customers like me and many others who can wait uh, like uh, for a long time to decide some simple issue uh, I mean, let me ask you, uh, you know the solution. So what is the solution? Having somebody that will, uh, you know, be available for you to help you solve the problem, right? Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's not related to marketing, not related to anyone else. It's the companies that don't care about the customers uh, at the level that they should care. I will, I will give you one, one example. I mean... What you mentioned uh, appears to me, I just lost my fa- my access to Facebook account because of the uh, two-factor authentication. I need somebody mm-hmm. from Facebook to basically disable it so I can log in. But, you know, of course, nobody is answering. Uh, and But the one of the... ...is, uh, you know, internet providers or mobile uh, companies, uh, look, if you are with them for like 10 years, they will not give you the discounts with the new contract. They will give the discounts to the new customers. So what people are doing here, they are saying, you know, uh, I'm going to terminate the contract and I'm going to go in as a new customer to get the discount. (laughs) You know, how, how ridiculous is that? Right, but but I'm telling you, related to the banks, related to the the, the big companies, mm-hmm. uh, if there's a bank that opens up right now that works online fully, and that all all, all the time has somebody available, they will close all the other banks. Mm-hmm. Basically, it, it's that simple. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, it's it's not working. I don't have the answer for that. I think much more smarter yeah. people than me uh, don't have the answer. I think the the good example is LinkedIn, talking about the support, talking about those team, uh, things. LinkedIn has uh, the account, it's called LinkedIn Help, that uh, is open to help you solve the problem. So they're open to communication. You can send them a message. You can even tag them. If you see the problem, they will reach out. Through the profile, you can send them what's over there. They will probably ask uh, if you can give them the access to your account. They will sort things out and go further. I use that option to, uh, that might be interesting for the listeners. I use that option to see how the algorithm is working. Because mm-hmm. I said there are some things that doesn't make sense on my profile, like the uh, reach is going uh, up and down, up and down. Can you take a look? And there are a lot more people that have these kind of uh, difficulties. So um, they say, okay, give us the access to your profile. We'll, we'll check it out. So they check it out and they say, everything is good with your content. Uh, but the, these are the 10 things that uh, usually affect this kind of behavior uh, when it comes to the content. So, and basically they told me how the algorithm works. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is I mean, it's interesting that nobody has done it before. Like all the, 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 the people that are branding themselves as LinkedIn influencers and experts for LinkedIn, right? Uh, said, come on, uh, you know, uh, nobody has ever get, got that information from LinkedIn, but I have the screenshots, right? Uh, not mm-hmm. talking just, just around that. So, uh, usually it's, the craziest guys that does it. What uh, most companies have is the support on Twitter. So for any platform, usually uh, if there is a chance to get somebody from support is going through Twitter because Twitter is the social media built for that. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, nice. By the way, once I got the message from Bridget Heinz, she uh, has like 4 million followers on the LinkedIn. And she asked me, do you know what's going on with LinkedIn algorithms? <laughs> because uh, I posted a few uh, messages that something changed. And uh, I found that many influencers, big influencers, don't know how algorithm works. Bec they care about human being. So, you know, you, you can uh, recognize, figure out how algorithm works, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, but they can change it. You know, they can change uh, because of... Uh, uh many other things and it's hard to recognize how ai can decide uh what which post to share with audience and if found the best way to think more about human being if you can help them then all groups will love you <laughs> so uh, it's my insight because from many influencers because i was shocked many of them really don't know how it works but they know how their audience uh what their audience wants to get. So, yeah, interesting. Uh, Nemanja, I have the final question. Uh, let's imagine you started from scratch without any experience, knowledge, skills. What will you do today to learn more about B2B marketing? Yeah, I got, I got this question yesterday, actually, on, on Instagram. Uh, look, the thing is, uh, I always like to look at a couple of people that are in the place where I want to be. So, uh, you know, get at least three of them. See, you know, those are my North Stars. I want to get over there and get as close as possible to them. The other thing that helps with that is get as close as possible to the revenue. Because if you are working as close as possible to the revenue, you will know what it takes to create the revenue. And the third one is get as close as possible to the customers. Meaning, I always like to say to the people that are starting from scratch, get into those things that we mentioned is to the customer, customer support or, uh, you know, direct response marketing. When you get the direct uh, feedback from the customers, you can fill them then to the close to the revenue so you can see how the revenue is made and as close as possible to the one to three person that are your North Star and block everybody else. Because there are so much noise around it. And most of the things that you will find on Google related to the B2B is no longer effective. The new thing can only be found on podcasts or uh, on LinkedIn if you follow specific people or on Twitter if you follow specific people. Uh, but nowhere else. You learn by doing. Because it's developing. And like, what can I tell you this month will be totally different the next month. So uh, it's a life thing, uh, growing, evolving. And that's, that's what I say. Get you, when you get closer to those people, uh, then you will probably be able to think for yourself and differentiate, right? But to get to the moment when you can differentiate yourself is uh, you first you need to learn. Then you will probably copy some of the people that you uh, admire. And you go because they are doing the right things and you are trying to do that as well. But then when you get to their level, you will know what you can do differently because you know what they know. So, yeah, uh, in short, that should that should uh, do the job. I love it. Love it. Because, yeah, uh, doing is more important than learning. Uh, over learning, it's not a good approach. For example, you know, I can read 100 books how to play basketball. But I never will beat Shaquille O'Neal or many other recognizable basketball players because they practice more than learn. Uh, they don't read the hundred books how to play basketball. They spend time uh, in the basketball field you now to practice their skills. So um, and I see when. Uh, by the way, once I got uh, the question, uh, if I listen all your episodes, can I become a great marketer. I told him, no, you can't. You can't because you don't need to learn everything that you can find online. You don't need to listen all uh, podcast episodes. Just choose something that will lead you in the right direction. Then you can implement and do this, not uh, overlearning. Overlearning hurts experience. Uh, people can forget for a few days about new knowledge. I, I can forget for a few hours. 
tell me something I can forget if I don't make notes, but uh, I make notes and I implement. I uh, yeah, testing is the best approach to find out and improve your skills. I love it. Внимание, it's a big pleasure to get in my show, to learn from you, tell our audience how they can, can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. Yeah, it was my pleasure uh, being, being here as well. Um, funkymarketing.net is the, the website. There you can find Funky Marketing Show, link to the podcast, uh, and also all the other social media, social media, you know, from LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, wherever I'm, I'm in, in, most, uh, in most places not keeping all my eggs in, in one bag. So uh, feel free to reach out. Feel free to send me a message. Always happy to, uh, to, to, to chat and help if I can. Nice, nice. By the way, guys, you need to follow Nemanja because you can see a lot of valuable insights. And if Nemanja has a lot of books on his background, that means he knows his stuff, you know. So I, I found that many offers uh, with uh, a lot of books on background can share valuable insights. I love your design on funky marketing. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, creative. It's not like common design online, guys. You need to open website. Uh, you can find in the description below and check out how it looks. Uh, more value on blog post. And uh, guys, uh, follow Nemanja. You can see a lot of value. Okay, guys. Love you. See you.